Hello, we are going to continue our unit on evolution and I'm going to be explaining a little bit more terms or evidence that will support the theory of evolution. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is molecular evidence, okay? This is called comparative evolution. This is when we examine amino acid similarities within different species. We're pretty much looking at the DNA sequences. Okay, so just so you know, like if we take hemoglobin and we compare a chimp and a human, we can see that there are hardly any differences. Okay, um, pretty much the chimp and a human share about 99% of the DNA. Okay, where if we compared a dog and a human for hemoglobin, we would see that there's not as many similarities. A lot of the variation that we see within the DNA sequences usually occurs because of mutations um, in the crossing over. Okay, so again, the more similarities you have within the DNA or the amino acid sequences, the more closely you are related. And you could kind of use it as a timeline to see exactly how many million years ago that we have diverged or evolved separately. The next thing we're going to talk about is comparative anatomy, pretty much studying the structures of different organisms. This is further evidence of evolution, and we have two different terms. We have homologous structures, and we have vestigial structures. Homologous structures are common parts with the same basic structure. So if you take a look here at the arms everything's been color coded you can see the color coded is the same here 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 okay and then again you can see they're color coded so they have the same basic parts within the different organisms all right um, the greater the number of homologous structures um, that different organisms share the closer the relationship among them okay so the more closely related if they have a lot of homologous structures and then this is just showing you another picture of that with actual the outer covering. Now, a vestigial structure is a structure that we have that we don't use. It maybe once had a function, but it's a structure that has no current function. Okay, um, our appendix is an example. Um, pig toes, two are shorter and don't touch the ground. There's no role for them in locomotion. So again, these are structures we have that we don't actually use. Um, and there's just one more thing when we talk about comparative anatomy. It's called an analogous feature. It's when unrelated species evolve a similar mode of existence. Um, their body parts may take on similar functions, okay? Um, kind of like the aquatic animals in general. Okay? Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is comparative embryology. This is the study of the developing organisms. We're going to kind of pair and contrast embryos. All right? Now, it's going to show a number of relationships not obvious in the fully grown organism. The more alike in the development of two organisms, the more closely related they are thought to be. And you could kind of see here we have... Um, stage one, stage two, and stage three of development, okay? You can see that a lot of them look very similar. Obviously, these are much different than this, but you can see there's a lot of similarities. And we're going to be doing an activity on this, and I know that you're going to find it very impressive to see how we are closely related. Okay, another term is called rapid evolution. Um, this is um, evolution that occurs in a quick period of time that we can actually see it. And I have some examples here. We have penicillin-resistant bacteria. Um, for a while, um, many years ago, you'd go to the doctor and they'd automatically give you some type of an antibiotic. Well, the bacteria started to not become um, affected by the antibiotic because there was some bacteria that had a mutation in them that did not allow them to be killed by that antibiotic or penicillin. So the bacteria were becoming resistant. And then when you were getting sick, they weren't, um, they were the ones that were reproducing, multiplying, so they were not becoming um, affected by the medicine. Same thing happened with the insecticide um, resistant cockroaches. You would spray, spray the cockroaches and every once in a while there'd be one that survived. 
Um, well, that would be the one that would reproduce and carry on so that you'd spray again and again, it would not occur. And again, the finches that we talked to it about with the Galapagos Islands is another example. Within a 20 year period, we were able to see the finches beaks change. Okay, so we've already said that survival of the fittest natural selection is um, those with the best adaptations will survive and reproduce. So just to kind of give you an idea, an adaptation is a product of evolution because of natural selection. And we do have a couple of them. We have structural adaptations, physiological or behavioral adaptations. So structural would be something like the teeth of the tiger that would be, you know, important in ripping through flesh. Um, behavioral adaptations would be maybe like an opossum playing dead. Physiological adaptations is like the clownfish or Nemo that can survive in the sea anemone. The sea anemone will sting, but again, the clownfish does not get affected because of the physiological nature of their scales, and they could survive, and it's almost a beneficial um, environment. And another example we have is um, the penguins, okay? Males have developed a special mechanism to allow them to incubate the egg without eating for as many as 115 days. And they'll just hold those eggs on their feet until they hatch. Okay. So, there are five factors that can change the equilibrium of a gene pool that will lead to evolution. Okay. So, we have mutation. Okay, mutation is pretty much an introduction of a new allele or um, maybe um, a change in the DNA sequence. Okay, this is going to cause an immediate but small shift in that equilibrium. Okay, it's typically spontaneous. All right, um, migration is the movement of organisms into or out of the population um, or moving um, into or out of the gene pool. Okay, so if an organism moving into or out of the population has a genotype different from that of the majority of the population, then a change in equilibrium occurs. Okay, genetic drift is a random change in allele frequency. It is due to chance and it happens in smaller populations. Okay, so in small populations, the frequency of a gene may be changed drastically by chance alone, resulting in a population with distinct genetic characteristics. And there are two things that cause that, the founder effect and the population bottleneck. And we'll kind of talk about that. There is a slide that will help in explaining the genetic drift. For selection, we've already talked about natural or artificial selection. If there's a strong selection on the population, then the equilibrium of the gene pool will change rapidly. Weak selection on a population results in less change. And then we have non-random mating. Um, this is if certain individuals in a population shows preference for mating with other individuals having the same or different phenotypes. It doesn't change the frequency of alleles, but rather the proportion of individuals that are homozygous. It's kind of like preferential mating. Okay, um, like or inbreeding. Okay, so just to kind of give you a visual, a mutation is the change in the DNA. Migration is moving into or out of the population again, which is the gene flow. Um, immigration is moving into a population, bringing in new alleles. Emigration is moving out of the population, which is removing the alleles. And again, the genetic drift is the change in the gene pool due to chance. So the smaller the population, the more impact that you have. And I said there were two types. There was the bottleneck effect and the founder effect. So the bottleneck effect is typically something catastrophic, earthquakes, floods, fires. Um, and that's going to create a smaller population. Okay, founder effect is like a couple individuals will leave to start a new colony. And that is what we've seen with the um, Galapagos Islands and the finches. Okay, this is just showing you the bottleneck effect. Um, the cheetah would be like another example of the bottle effect. Okay, again, more bottleneck effect.
Okay, and then again, the founder effect is a couple individuals starting off a new um, colony. Okay, so balancing selection occurs when natural selection maintains stable frequencies of two or more phenotypic phenotypic forms in a population. And it's kind of the result of the heterozygote. Um, when heterozygotes have greater reproductive success than homozygotes. And we see this with sickle cell anemia and malaria. So those that are heterozygotes for sickle cell anemia are actually protected from the severe effects of malaria. And they do not die because of that. All right. There is the frequency dependent selection, which is the survival and reproduction of any one morph declines if the phenotypic form becomes too common in the population. All right, so the butterflies have this with their different coloration patterns. Um, birds kind of develop a search image that enables them to locate and feed on that species of butterfly. Okay, so the frequency of the other co color patterns tend to increase. And there's a neutral variation, um, which is a genetic variation that provides no apparent selective advantage for some individuals. And our example for that is human fingerprints. All of our fingerprints are very unique. Okay, so the term speciation is the evolution of a new species. Now, there are certain things that are going to help with that. So these are factors of speciation, which is prezygotic barriers, things that prevent mating from occurring. Okay, so we have geographic isolation, which is typically some, separated by something with the environment, like mountains, rivers, canyons. Ecological or habitat isolation um, is when two populations require different habitats. Behavioral isolation is the mating pattern of a small group of organisms become different from that of the main group. And those um, species are very particular on their mating patterns. Seasonal or temporal isolation is the different um, reproductive um, cycles or the breeding cycles that occur. So a certain flower will um, flower at a certain time of the year, um, will not be able to mix up or pollinate a flower or a different plant species from one that would, let's say, reproduce in the winter. Mechanical isolation is the physical characteristics will keep them um, from interbreeding. So it will not, the reproductive parts don't match. And then gametic isolation means that the sperm and the egg are not compatible. So just to kind of give you a visual of those, geographic isolation is separated by um, a mountain, river, canyon. Okay, so when we have geographic isolations, we have what's called allopatric speciation. This is a speciation that's due to being separated by a geographic barrier. Ecological isolation, um, we have different species requiring different habitats. You can also kind of think of like there's freshwater fish and saltwater fish. Behavioral isolation is when you have different mating, mating that occurs, mating behaviors that occur, mating dances, and so forth. Seasonal isolation is dif different reproductive cycles. And mechanical isolation is the reproductive parts don't match. Okay, so sympatric speciation is when a new species develops without the geographic isolation. And this typically happens in plants, but it's the formation of a species as a result of genetic chain that will produce reproductive variables. Okay, so Parapatric speciation occurs in populations that lie adjacent to each other. The environment will vary. So an example would be like grass growing in the presence of toxic metals. Okay. Um, so there is going to be a part two of this PowerPoint for you to continue. Um, and then we will take any questions tomorrow. So please watch part two.